Good morning. Let's go ahead and bring our November 2021 meeting at the State Transportation Board to order. So thank you for being here. At this point, I'd like to ask Jeff Lewis if you would lead us in our invocation and we'll follow with the Pledge of Allegiance. Reliance on you, Father. Thank you for all that you provide for us, Lord. Especially as we go into these holiday seasons of Thanksgiving and Christmas, Lord, remind us of all that we're thankful for and should be thankful for. And Father, I pray I lift up blessings for this meeting, for this department, and for our entire state. May our proceedings go according to your will, and may we live in your name. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Thank you for being here. This is very exciting to see so many people in person. We've still got a few that are calling in virtually right now. So, uh, Christian, if you would, please do a roll call. Yes, I'll go back to the district. Uh, okay. District 1, Ms. Purcell. Here. District 2, Mr. Floyd. Here. District 3, Mr. Carricker. Here. District 4, Mr. Brown. 5, Ms. Key. Here. Six, Mr. Abel. Here. Seven, Mr. Bowen. Here. Eight, Mr. Golden. Here. Nine, Ms. Dunn. Here. Ten, Mr. Bothell. Here. Eleven, Mr. Lewis. Here. Twelve, Mr. Morris. Thirteen, Ms. Lemon. And fourteen, Mr. Sharon. Okay, well thank you for being here and thank you for calling in as well. So at this time, I hope you all read your minutes from the October meeting. So uh, could I have a motion to approve those minutes as presented? Do you have a second? second. All in favor? Aye. Thank you. All right, at this time, we'll call Mr. Albert Shelby, our Director of Program Delivery for his motion, or his report, I'm sorry. <laughs> Good morning, Madam Chair, Commissioner, <laughs> members of the board. I'm here to present the projects the department is proposing to advertise for the December 2021 letting. Before we present December, here are the FY 2022 results. We have led a total of 85 projects in FY 2022. This chart shows the number of projects by improvement type. The value of these 85 projects is approximately $432 million through the October 2021 bid awards with 83 G GDOT let projects worth approximately 431 million and two local let projects worth 450,000. This chart shows a dollar amount distribution by improvement type with maintenance, bridge and road projects making up the bulk of those types. Here are the results of the October 2021 letting. Of the 19 GDOT let contracts presented to the board, 16 were awarded and three were rejected from the letting. Now I'm going to discuss the projects in the December 2021 letting. We have a total of 24 projects and all are GDOT let. The next two slides list these 23 non-TF projects arranged by congressional district. As you can see with this slide, we are letting a variety of projects throughout the state to address bridge, capacity, maintenance, and safety issues. The December 2021 letting is a safety-focused letting. As you probably noticed in the project list a few slides back, many of the projects are safety-focused. We propose to let a variety of safety improvements such as roadway signage um, and marking, pedestrian crossing improvements, and pavement markings. These projects are a great example of our continued commitment to improve the safety for the traveling public. This next highlighted project is the replacement of the structurally deficient bridge on Stanfield Road over Reedy Creek. The existing bridge was constructed in 1967, 54 years ago. 
Here's a ground view of that bridge to be replaced. The next project is the replacement of the structurally deficient bridge on Dixie Road over Boggy Creek. The existing bridge was constructed in 1965, 56 years ago. And here's a ground view of that bridge to be replaced. The next project will resurface State Route 96 from Sumter Street in Taylor County to Nacamosas Creek in Crawford County. The length of the project is seven miles. The section was last repaid in 2006, 15 years ago. This next project will patch and repair the concrete on I-85 from Upper Big Springs Road to State Route 54 in Troop County. The length of the project is 11.35 miles. There have been many projects over the years to patch damaged slabs. This is an excellent example of our continued commitment to maintain our existing infrastructure in this corridor. The next project will widen State Route 24 U.S. 41, 441 from the Eatonton Bypass to the Morgan County line for 9.2 miles. U.S. 441 is part of the Governor's Road Improvement Program, also known as GRIP. The final project is the replacement of the structurally deficient bridge on Daisy Nettles Highway over Thick Creek. The existing bridge was constructed in 1975, 46 years ago. And here's a ground view of that bridge to be replaced. Good morning, members of the board. Here to present the TIA project for the December letting. Um, we have one project in the letting uh, in Burke County, Congressional District 12 is the West Side Waynesboro Bypass. Um, this road will create a 2.1 mile new location route, um, also inserting a roundabout at State Route 56 and State Route 24, and it connects the those two state routes to uh, U.S. 25 State Route 121 on the west side of Waynesboro. Um, this project represents a little over a $5 million TIA commitment in the CSRA region, um, one of the last major projects that we will be letting in TIA 1 before TIA 2 starts at the beginning of 23. This project is also a great example of how he has cooperated with locals. It has um, local funding as well, and it has state funding attached to the project as well. So. so we have 24 projects proposed for the December 2021 letting. This chart shows the distribution by improvement types. The estimate of the project in the December 2021 letting is approximately 100.6 million. This chart shows the dollar amount distribution by improvement type. And now I ask for your consideration for approval of the proposed projects presented for the December 2021 letting. Does anyone have any questions or comments? Okay, at this time, could we have a motion to approve the December letting? Okay, all in, any other questions, comments? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Thank you, Mr. Shelby. A good report, as usual. Okay, at this time, we're going to ask uh, Mr. Matt Markham, our D Deputy Director of Planning. Good morning, Madam Chair, uh, Commissioner, members of the board. Um, I'm here this morning to bring to you uh, projects for um, board review, revisions to the construction work program, as well as uh, projects that I came to you last month. Um, for review that I'm, I'm coming before you again this morning for, for board action. Um, so first, uh, we have one project I'm bringing before you for review this month. I'll come back to you next month um, for action on this one. Um, this is an intersection improvement along State Route 3 and Northside Drive. Um, it's an additional project um, for the ones that I brought before you last month that came out of the Northside Drive corridor study, um, a series of projects that were designed to provide operational improvements um, and improve safety along Northside Drive. Um, so this is an additional project, a part of that, um, that longer term corridor um, that I'll come back to you next month for, for board action. Um, are there any questions about this one? <clears throat> okay. If not, then um, the ones that, I, that you see before you here, these seven projects, 
Um, these are the projects that I did come to you last month for review um, and are coming back this month for action. Um, six of the seven are um, projects that are part of a longer project for the Northside Drive that came out of the Northside Drive corridor study. Um, overall purpose of those projects are to reduce crashes, um, improve multimodal safety and operations. Um, again, these came out of a study led by the Office of Program Delivery or into being asked as an addition to the construction work program. Um, the last project on that list um, replaces a culvert on State Route 120 in Gwinnett County. Um, this was recommended by the District 1 office to improve drainage along that corridor. Um, so I'll be happy to take any questions or otherwise I ask for your um, action on these items. Any questions? Okay, at this time, can we have a motion to approve these revisions? Do you have a second? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Okay, thank you so much. Okay, Mr. Commissioner. Thank you, Madam Chair, ladies and gentlemen of the board. Um, it's not lost on me that we back to Wednesday and Thursdays, and it's only 9-12, I believe. So if you'd like me to stretch this for another hour, I can, or we can move very efficiently. So <laughs> I said go for it. <laughs> All right. Well, let's start as we always do with our state transportation fund collection report from the prior month being October. Uh, October collections totaled 186.7, or excuse me, 186.17 million dollars. The breakdown on that is excise 167 million, which represents a 9% increase as compared to October of last year. And transportation fee components totaled 18.837 million dollars. And as compared to October a year ago, the highway impact fees were 27% above last year and the hotel fees are uh, right at 52.6% uh, above last year, excuse me, 59% from the calendar year ago. So uh, that's a positive trend. As we look at the fiscal year to date numbers for motor fuel and transportation fees total $744.6 million. The breakdown on that is $673.9 million was in excise, which it represents a year-to-date compared to a year ago, year-to-date uh, increase of 9.3 percent. Uh, the transportation fees year-to-date total 70.71 million dollars, and the breakdown is comparing year-to-date to prior year. Year-to-date uh, represents a 15.5 percent increase in the transportation impact fees, and a 52 percent increase, almost 53% increase in the hotel fees. So uh, more people are traveling and certainly more people are staying in hotels as compared to a year ago. So that has a positive revenue generation. So a uh, year to date uh, compared back to the last fiscal year, we're about $80.2 million ahead of where we are were back then. So that's a positive trend. Now let me talk about employment a little bit. Again, the men and women of GDOT that do such a fantastic job, well, they're, they're out there working hard. Our total employment numbers hovered about the same, 3,610 employees, uh, full-time employees. We do have 37 temporary maintenance staff on top of the 3,610. We hired 74 employees last month, but separated 45. Uh, at least that's a positive trend on the net. <laughs> that we netted more people coming in the door than going out, which is uh, important to drive that 3,610 number back up closer to 4,000. So let me move into our professional services procurement update. Last month, 148 contracts were executed for professional services, totaling about $60.6 .6 million for engineering, design, right-of-way, geotechnical, and all the professional services necessary to get projects to you to uh, advertise for a bid. Uh, year to date, 714 contracts have been executed at a total of about $306 million. Again, so that's all the work that's necessary to get projects uh, through the pipeline. Now, uh, as always, let me move into some highlights of projects open to traffic since we were together last. And we'll start up in 
GDOT District 1, Dawson County, which is Congressional District 9. And this is a safety operational project, which consists of two roundabouts uh, on State Route 9 at Dawson Forest Road. Uh, this is a great picture here of a really a odd intersection before the two roundabouts that was very confusion. Uh, there's two schools just right off to the uh, right off this image, so a very busy area on State Route 9 in Dawson County with those schools. Uh, the contractor was Vertical Earth Incorporated, open to traffic on October 14th. It represents a $5.35 million investment for those two roundabouts and the project uh, open to traffic ahead of schedule. Now let's move into a new capacity project in Congressional District 12 in Richmond County, which is GDOT District 2 over toward the Augusta area or the Grovetown area, if you know that area. This project consists of 2.4 miles of widening and reconstruction of State Route 10, US 278 uh, at the new gate at Fort Gordon, which I'll remind you is now the Cyber Command Center for the nation. So they have a lot of expansion at Fort Gordon, Gordon associated with Cyber Command. And so this, this two, almost two and a half miles of widening was done by state, uh, by ER Snell contractors. Uh, and it opened to traffic October 23rd. It represents a $19.5 million investment by GDOT with 100% state funds. And I might add a lot of coordination with our district uh, folks over in District 2, which was both Corbett Reynolds and Jimmy Smith in his prior role. And certainly a lot of coordination with the base on how we did this uh, over on part of the Fort Gordon's uh, property as well and be in sync. In fact, we have our portion done ahead of the Army Corps of Engineers having their gate entrance done. So timing was everything and I'm glad we, we made it on time and actually just slightly ahead of our schedule uh, to have it open. So a great, a great project there supporting obviously very important work there at Fort Gordon. Next, we'll move into Congressional District 12 for a major bridge replacement in Jeff at the Jeff Davis Montgomery County line in GDOT District 5. This is a design build project uh, with a 1.05 mile bridge replacement of two structurally deficient bridges on State Route 135 over the Altamaha River, which is obviously a large river. Uh, the contractor was Scott Bridge Company. This was a TIA project as well. Uh, and let me talk about that as Kenneth just came up and talked about the Waynesboro uh, route there. Very critical how TIA helps us advance projects. So let me tell you the funding makeup and I give, I give uh, Kenneth a lot of credit and Angela and her team a lot of credit. This was a $27.86 million investment in those two bridges. Again, these are big bridges. Uh, but here's the breakdown of funding. Uh, we had $19 million of bridge bond money, so we were thankful for the legislature for their bridge bond money. We had $3.5 million of HB 170 dollars, or state dollars, $1.7 million of TIA co contribution. We had some earmarks of $313,000, some old earmarks, and then we put $450,000 of regular federal. So. We put all those funding sources into the soup to deliver a project. So uh, again, a lot of innovation there, figuring out how to put dollars together to advance these big projects such as this. Uh, this project was uh, open to traffic on September 24th, and you can see the nice photo there with the team, uh, and it was ahead, opened ahead of schedule. Now this next project I'm gonna update you on is in Congressional District 14 up in Polk County and GDOT District 6. And you're going to have a hard time seeing it from the road because it's an airport runway expansion. Uh, that was the extension of runway 28-10 uh, up in the Polk County Cornelius Moore Field. Uh, the contractor was Astra Group uh, and it was completed last month. It represents a $6.87 million investment uh, where in this case the federal aviation share was uh, the subordinate share of 869000 the state put in 4.88 million and the local share was about 1.12 million. So and again, supporting Georgia's airports uh, across the state. I'm glad to have that project done. Now let me move into some highlights and honors and recognitions uh, since we were together last time and as I always like to do and 
You know, it's always great to have a star among you, and we certainly have a star with us this morning, and that's Ann Purcell, who was named Savannah Technical College Foundation's Community Star. Communities, yeah. <laughs> the Community Stars honor people who make the world a better place through their dedication to work, community leadership, and volunteer service. With Ann's commitment to making things better in her community, it's easy to understand why Savannah Technical College gave her this recognition. And you can see in the photo, I believe we have this fine gentleman in the audience with us, Dr. Dent Purcell. Uh, in the photo on the left and then on the right, you have State Rep Billy, uh, Bill Hitchens, uh, Billy Hickman, our state senator there, and Representative John Burns. So all, what a great day and congratulations. I guess, Ann, you get a star on a sidewalk somewhere. Uh, we'll 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 get to that a little later this morning. So, all right. So, in the theme of recognitions and honors, this is hot off the press. Just happened yesterday. We have not one but two awards that come from the Intelligent Transportation Society of Georgia, or ITS Georgia. Uh, each year, ITS Georgia recognizes outstanding people and projects and organizations that continue to make Georgia a leader in the development and deployment of operations of intelligent transportation systems. And I think we all know that we're a leader nationally, but it's nice to be recognized through a professional organization. Let me tell you about these two awards. The first one was the 2021 Outstanding Agency Contribution Award. And this one goes to not traffic operations, but to GDOT's IT team. And the reason they awarded this was for working tirelessly to build the digital backbone necessary that allowed our traffic management systems, uh, center, our traffic TMC, I think all, you all know where that is, but we actually went to 100% virtual operations during the pandemic. Think about that big center over there and all the screens and technology, we were able to operate that virtually uh, from during the pandemic, which again, protected, protected our employees and our consultants and all the team that worked there and were able to make it work. It's just amazing. So. Uh, we learned a lot from that. So IT made it all happen, though. It just, you know, you just don't stand things up overnight without a lot of technical background. So congratulations to the IT team. The second award is for the 2021 ITS Small Project of Significance Award. And this went to our TMC operations group uh, for the Carbine c uh, universe, deploy universe deployment. And this is what I briefed you guys on a few months ago of where when you're call 511 that we're able to really locate where you are, especially if you're in a busy area in Metro Atlanta where there may be multiple roadways and through, again, through anonymity, we can figure out where people are and then deploy heroes or first responders a lot more effectively to those locations. So that's what that's about. So congratulations to both GDOT IT and our TMC operations on receiving those awards. Now in personnel news, um, sort of good news and some bittersweet news I share with you. Uh, first, uh, I announced that Van Mason has given his intent to retire. Van is our District 4 district engineer. He will be retiring in January of next year after more than 32 years of dedicated service to GDOT. And he will be replaced with Scott Chambers, who is currently the assistant district engineer in District 4 and also our district maintenance engineer there. And Scott's got a long career as well, so he will follow Van. And then also on December 1st, our district engineer Rob McCall from the Jessup District, District 5, will be retiring after 32 years of service as well. Troy Pittman, District 5 pre-construction engineer, has been selected to fill Rob's uh, job as district engineer. So we want to We'll both recognize Rob and Van uh, later uh, this year uh, in December and January, I believe, uh, appropriately and potentially roast them and tell them they're quitters. Uh, but uh, we wish them the best, but I just wanted to make sure you're aware of this and uh, certainly, certainly welcome Scott and Troy uh, to, the, to the helm as the district engineers. You know how important district engineers are to all of you and how important they are to the department. So uh, I ask that you be patient and, and work with them as they come on board and stand up. And the good news is we have a little bit of transition time with Rob and Van, and I mean a little bit. So we're looking forward to many years 
many years of service for Troy and Scott. Uh, I don't know if they knew when they agreed to that 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 was a ten a minimum of a ten year term. So uh, so anyway, we'll try to keep them around. All righty. You know, I missed I missed something earlier, and I'll come back to it. But uh, I think you all know that I'm a slot baseball fan, and you know it was a pretty good pretty good year as things turned out for the Atlanta Braves. And I wanted to highlight something. Obviously, when you win a World Series, you get a parade. Well, that comes with planning and execution, and I'm very proud of the work that GDOT did teaming with so many. Uh, such as Cobb DOT and Cobb County Police, Georgia State Patrol, the city of Atlanta, of course, uh, emergency management agency here at, at the state level, and also the Fulton County EMA as well, in coordination with the Braves. Uh, we provided support from our TMC, from the ITS the op, Signal Ops uh, Division, GDOT District 7, I think Paul's here today, Paul Denard and his team, and certainly heroes, and none of this comes together without communications getting the message out about traffic and traffic impacts. In total, we had about 60 employees uh, uh, that were contributed to execution of the parade. We actually deployed over 500 of the construction barrels, 70 water fill barricades, 20 top three barricades for road closures, and then uh, had about 25 vehicles uh, deployed uh, as well. So uh, great day. I'm proud to say that all the effort put forth by GDOT employees and the team as a whole was a home run. Now, we had nothing to do with how fast the parade went. I just want everybody to know that. Uh, so, but we like efficient moving traffic, so that was not too bad either. So, but congratulations to the team. Uh, things come together pretty quick, and uh, I'm, I'm really proud. Uh, John Hibbert leading the team from the operations side and and Paul at the district level to make it happen because it really did come together somewhat overnight. So uh, great day. And it was nice that it was close to the building as well. Now into uh, more uh, serious business and very important business is I'm proud to announce that we had our annual DBE and small business a virtual forum. I'm sorry, I didn't click through all the pictures there. There's the parade route. And it's a major, major event when you close down exits to 285 that's at Cobb Parkway but it went very well traffic traffic uh, went very well as well okay so super excited that we held again our annual what has become our annual DB and small business forum but obviously virtual this year and this was held last week and it's a great example of the productive events that Kimberly and King and her team continue to deploy with all our resources, even where we're still, you know, dealing with COVID and trying to keep people distanced and safe. Uh, the purpose of the forum is really for businesses to meet, have the opportunity to meet prime contractors, learn about the upcoming GDOT projects that we have on the horizon for business planning and strategy, network with obviously other businesses and small business, and really a lot of the high value part is attending the breakout sessions where you can really have some collaboration and get more specific details. And then even through the virtual platform, we had a live panel discussion uh, on professional services firms. And so uh, really want to thank Stacy Key for kicking it off and saying some very encouraging words of inspiration to, to everybody participating. And this is what's pretty amazing. Let me give you some of the data about the attendance because this, this again, it just continues to grow, which is fantastic. We had 316 registered attendees, which we think is probably the record. Had 134 one-to-one -one networking connections virtually. So connecting people together is what it's all about. And so that's really strong. There was the 12 breakout sessions that I mentioned, which averaged about 58 attendees a breakout session, which is large. I mean, that's a, that's a room full of people if you were to be physically present. So uh, that is fantastic. And then from, from this, there were 48 meetings scheduled between attendees and exhibitors to have more follow-up. So not that you came and got some education, but it continues on uh, building relationships after the fact. So uh, really happy. It certainly was a high level of interest. And again, I really applaud Kimberly and her team for pursuing and figuring out how to deploy technology as well to really make it meaningful. So. Uh, we'll we'll figure out what next year looks like. Maybe it's back in person or hybrid. Uh, 
but again, uh, something that started has become an annual event, and it's, it's so great to see it continue to grow. So uh, really a great day there. Now, and finally, let me just, uh, I'll say finally and then give you one more thing, I think. <laughs> but uh, I wanted to share a little bit about some good news. It's really just so encouraging as, as we talk about our culture at GDOT, that we want it to be one of innovation and collaboration. And that's exactly what I want to talk to you about, where employees have come together and find ways to improve processes and procedures. Our saying is simply, find a way to make it better. If we can just focus on make it better and, and empower employees to do that, they will absolutely rise to the occasion and make things better for GDOT and for the public. So this example is where our maintenance crews in District 2 did just that. They found a more efficient and safe way to repair the damaged cable guardrails along I-16. Those are the cables that run in the median that you see. And when they get hit, obviously they have to be repaired. When District 2 crews had to repair the replaced damaged cables, they previously required four or more people just to lift the cable. Those cables are very heavy. So you got to lift that cable up and then another one or two people have to slide a clip in to hold the cable on the post. And it's it's pretty dangerous work as well. So this took two crews, which means one of the crews is not in their normal county. So it took two crews to come together uh, just to go do the repair. And assistant foreman Randy Bowman from the Greene County maintenance crew found a better way. He developed a new concept using the crew's dump truck to take over the heavy lifting part and uh, uh, Randy uh, collaborated with the District General Trades Technician, William Meeks, to come up with how to fabricate and weld an adjustable prototype steel post to support a chain apparatus you can see in the picture there that grabs a hold of the cable and really lifts it up. They have informally referred to this new innovation as the back saver for good reason. And I'm going to ask the audio, I'm going to ask the audio visual booth back there if they can play the video and we'll show you how this works. My name is Randall Bowman. I'm the assistant foreman out of Greene County. My name is Arthur Porter. I'm the highway maintenance foreman out of Greene County. Well, one of the challenges was the lifting of the cable with multiple people. The challenge was trying to get the, the post up after, the, after a wreck or so. And that was one of the challenges, just trying to do the job and do it safely and where it won't be so painful afterwards. So we decided to let's try with the dump truck help pick the cable up and we reset the poles and pull the poles out that damage can't come out. So we decided to do it like that and uh, it seemed to be working out pretty good. A long time ago when I was working with Matt Zone Locker, he was saying, well, so we just use the dump truck sometimes to help pull up the posts or the sign posts because they be in concrete. So it's been in the back of my mind all the time, what could I do to use the dump truck to help with the hydraulic to put it, pick it up. So, we just start talking about it. We start out with a sign post, and it won't really strong enough, but we feel like we need to develop something with a little more structure. And that's how we come down and going down and, and Mr. William and Bubba uh, came up with a higher uh, frame of iron, quarter inch iron with a hook on it. And uh, it seems to be working out. That's where the dump's actually lifting it up there. You
and it might can be developed a little bit more. This is just a prototype, and I guarantee uh, DOT going to this type of uh, work, we're going to need something like this, even with smaller crews. Probably uh, additionally, probably an hour, hour and a half to do it if we didn't have the, the dump truck. Yeah. Uh, and a lot the, of energy. Oh, you know, yeah, a lot of energy. The entire, you know, just, yeah. just pulling up the cable so hard. Yeah, it's saving us really a lot. Uh, and that's the uh, the first uh, prototype was the back saver. Yeah. This is the back saver too that yeah. we named it. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> it, it just it does take a lot of energy and take a lot of crews to do this. And so just to find something that helps someone do their job a whole lot better, that's what it's all about. It, 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 as long as the job gets done safely and where no one gets hurt, that's the main objective of this whole idea. And again, this is all Randy idea and I thank him for. It. If you look at that last one, less than five hundred dollars to manufacture, uh, we can we can do in house. And that's certainly a lot less than sending somebody to the doctor for back sprain or, or, or workforce injury. So again, congratulations to Randy for coming up with the back saver 1.0. Now we're on 2.0 and, and we'll hard, be hard to beat those Green County people. Yeah. You should, you should know. I say we apply for a patent and let those gentlemen take that on Shark Tank. That may not, not, not be a bad idea because there was no device currently made for that. Uh, so uh, the way they install it is differently when the contractors install it using different equipment. Um, but we don't have that equipment and it's not really something you want to have, especially equipment just for that. So what a great job for them. And I congratulate the District 2 team for being innovative and now they'll get the benefit statewide of being more efficient and safe, as you heard the foreman there, it's all about safety. So uh, so congratulations to them, and maybe we'll chair it Shark Tank. My last item uh, was, and I just wanted to uh, show this, and I appreciate Jamie for bringing the hard copy. Some of you had seen this in the Atlanta Business Chronicle back November 5th, 11th. About 50 years of the perimeter area, right at 285 and 400 perimeter center area, and there's just some really nice comments about the partnership from each of the three mayors in that area about the partnership they have with GDOT and how important transportation is to this area. So if you get a chance, you may want to take a take a snag at that uh, or take a take a snag this and read it or check it out online. But very nice article and certainly supportive of our municipalities that we work in work so closely with when we're doing very disruptive work with 285 and 400 at their front door, but a lot of positivity and a very nice article. Jamie, thank you for sharing that. I know se several of you have seen it and mentioned it to me, but just wanted to call attention to that. So, Madam Chair, that concludes my report. I'll be glad to answer any questions or comments anybody may have. Any comments? I do have a comment. I want to commend District 1 and the County of Dawson for doing those two roundabouts. That's two of four that they have done, but to make those a priority, they are beautiful, they work well, and they take a lot of uh, hazardous driving down. There's a lot of on those back roads, people go pretty fast, including myself, so I feel much safer, but I think those were great projects, and I drive out of my way to go through them because they are that nice. Well, thank you. Thanks for acknowledging that, and those in Dawson County were it was a very unique intersection before that was very hard to traverse. It was confu confusion for people to drive through it, and, and it's certainly a much better outcome. Thank you. Madam Chair, this is Greg Morris. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Please go ahead. Oh, would it be okay if I was recognized for a statement? Yes. Uh, yes, I was. I was. Um, I wanted to uh, thank the commissioner and all of the folks, uh, the transportation department folks, on the Hazelhurst Bridge that you saw the picture of. If there was somebody in a boat, center console boat, that might have been me. Uh, I passed <laughs> that bridge about every two weeks, which I can do now that I couldn't do before with the old bridge. I don't know what was that guy in the Bible that the lady dropped the rock on his head. You wouldn't sit under that bridge uh, with the old bridge. Uh, that bridge replacement is uh, is a wonderful thing for our community and the folks that I used to represent in the legislature that are just my neighbors now. 
Uh, one important aspect of that bridge project that I wanted to commend, uh, and I was in the legislature as I stated at the time, was the original plans was to dismantle that bridge and replace the bridge at the same spot. Uh, and the commissioner and uh, and all the people involved, you mentioned the funding sources that we used. We had to spend a little more money, but they agreed. And we were grateful to leave the current bridge and replace the bridge at a different location. And what that did uh, was saved uh, untold amount of money and time. We were looking at what commission, I think it was like a 50 mile uh, uh, bypass that we were going to have to to uh, to to have if we didn't leave the the, the old bridge uh, in place for people to use, uh, and it saved a lot of health care, uh, commerce. Uh, it, it was just a, a good thing for us to do. A, a straight line isn't always the best way to go, and working with us on that was was very very much appreciated. Uh, I want to reiterate what the commissioner said about Tia. Uh, Tia has been a, has wrought miracles uh, in our part of the state. Uh, we were one of the first regions, well, we were in the first regions that passed Tia. And uh, the bridge replacement there, the bridge replacement at the uh, bridge on US number one and US number one work that we have now, uh, we didn't necessarily get it completely right in the legislature but I've always said my two most important boats that I liked in my career, uh, and there was a lot of boats, was the boat dual enrollment and the boat that uh, created uh, a TIA. So uh, we are uh, very much uh, uh, have benefited uh, from, from TIA and passing legislation and having money for it. But if you don't execute the projects, it doesn't matter. And, and the transportation department has done an excellent job in our area uh, executing our TIA projects. The money just didn't sit around. We're using it uh, uh, for our benefit. So Madam Chair, that's a little long statement. I don't talk as much as I used to. I had a good friend at home since I left the legislature told me I'm enjoying seeing you a lot and hearing you a lot less. Um, so I, I, I kind of, I said thank you, and it sounded like a compliment, but I'm not so sure. Uh, but uh, but I, uh, thank you for letting me make that statement. You're welcome, Mr. Uh, Worsa. It's wonderful. We appreciate all your comments, and we're so glad you're here. But I especially think that all your comments were spot on in every way, between the bridges and the TIA. So we are very happy you're here, and hope to see you in person next month. So, oh, I hope so. I, I'm, I'm still, I'm still around. <laughs> okay, I'm we we want to hear you talk, so we'll get you warm back up. <laughs> okay. okay, thank you. Okay, thank at this you. time, all right. Any other comments? Okay, very nice report, Mr. Commissioner. Uh, this time we'll have our board committee report. Something we haven't had in a very long time. So, uh, Mr. Golden, I believe you have the first report. Thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> Let me first off thank Ann Purcell, the vice chair, for presiding over the meeting yesterday in my absence. I was on the phone, by the way, so let the record reflect I did call in. But Ann, thank you very much for taking over the report. I also would like to thank Josh Waller for the outstanding work he continues to do on legislative affairs and appreciate all the hard work. Had a heavy load for Josh to, to carry. The legislative committee convened at 1 p.m. on Wednesday, uh, November the 17th. Board members present included uh, Vice Chair Ann Purcell, who chaired the meeting, Emily Dunn, Kevin Abel, Robert Brown, Russ Character, uh, Stacy Key, Jimmy Boswell, Jeff Lewis, Johnny Floyd, and Jerry Sharon. And again, I was calling in by phone. First order of biz business, Josh Waller, Director of Policy and Government Affairs, provided an update on the recently enacted Federal Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. Josh highlighted a few key areas, including enhanced formula funding, competitive grant funding, and pilot programs, including policy changes. He underscored the need to evaluate options on how best to identify state funds for additional federal matching requirements. Josh provided an update on recently adopted county TIA t votes and then presented the proposed 2022 legislative agenda for the committee's approval. 
Committee actions, uh, Emily Dunn made a motion to approve the 2022 legislative agenda seconded by Johnny Floyd and was unanimously a approved. There being no further business, Chair, Chair Ann Purcell adjourned the meeting at 1.41 p.m. And Madam Chair, now I would ask that a motion, uh, we would have a motion from the full board and a vote to approve the 2022 legislative agenda that was presented yesterday. Okay, do we have a motion to approve the legislative agenda that was presented yesterday? I'll move. Do we have a second? Second. Any comments? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Thank you. Okay, now Ms. Ann. Um, the Intermodal Committee convened at 1.42 p.m. Wednesday, November the 17th. Board members present included Vice Chair Ann Purcell, Emily Dunn, Kevin Abel, Robert Brown, Russ Character, Stacy Key, Jamie Boswell, Jeff Lewis, Johnny Floyd, and Jerry Sharon. Uh, Chairman Floyd was on the phone with us as we uh, affected through our business of today. Uh, the first order of business was from Ralph Daniel Waterway, project manager for the Division of Intermodal, presented us an update on the Savannah Harbor expansion project. He discussed the project features that had been completed since the last update to the board in 2019 and the status of the remaining projects. The project construction began in 2015 to deepen the Savannah River to allow larger ships to access the port. Dredging operations to finish the deepening are scheduled to be completed in 2022. Construction of the remaining mitigation features in pro progress which will continue after dredging is complete. There's been no further business. The vice chair and Priscilla adjourned the meeting at 1.53 p.m. Okay, thank you. I believe you have the next report as well. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the statewide transportation planning strategic planning committee met. Uh, for, we convened at 2 p.m. on Wednesday, November the 17th, 2021, and the board members present included the chair, Ann Purcell, Emily Dunn, Kevin Abel, Robert Brown, Russ Character, Stacy Key, Jamie Boswell, Jeff Lewis, Johnny Floyd, and Jerry Sharon. The first order of business, Tom uh, Kaplia who was the branch chief in the division of the planning, presented the Georgia Ready for Accelerated Development, which is called GRAD, and the site analysis. He provided an assessment of the existing transportation infrastructure in the vicinity of the Georgia Ready for Accelerated Development, again, GRAD sites across the state. GRAD sites are industrial sites which have been certified by the Georgia Department of Economic Development as being ready for fast track construction due to prior due diligence being done. GDOT analysis was designed to assist with marketing the sites by sharing a wide range of transportation related data on the existing infrastructure, such as access to the four lane highway or the interstate, intermodal connections, and the proximity to major transportation and logistic access, such as the airports and the Georgia port in Savannah and in uh, Glenn County. As we followed through with the second order of business, Daniel Doster, Transportation Planning Specialist, gave us an update on the Georgia Community Options, the GCO. The goal of the Georgia Community Options, formerly the Clean Air Campaign, is to reduce the number of single occupancy vehicles on our regional roads and improve air quality. The GCO program supports employers as well as commuters by providing education and incentives to support carpooling, van pooling, teleworking, and other alternatives to driving to work alone. The program has been funded by the Federal Congestion Mitigation and Air Quality Improvement Funds since 1994 and was administered directly by the Georgia Department of Transportation Planning Office from its incentive until 2017. The Georgia Department of Transportation now partners with the Atlanta Regional Commission who administers that program. The committee action was being no father business. We actually adjourned the meeting at 2.20 p.m. Okay, thank you. And I have the final committee report. The committee as a whole convened at 2.30 p.m. on Wednesday, November 17, 2021. Board members present included myself, Abel, Brown, Purcell, Carriker, Key, Boswell, 
Lewis and Sharon. Our first order of business was Emily Fish, our Assistant State Maintenance Engineer of Emergency, Oper Emergency Operations, gave an update on the 21-22 winter weather preparedness. She gave a briefing on this season's weather outlook, followed by internal and external preseason preparations. She discussed district preparedness discussion, including equipment, plans, and supplies on hand. The synopsis was provided by the of new and updated technology that is being incorporated to enhance winter weather operations. Lastly, statistics for statewide winter weather operations were provided. Our second order of business, Andrew Honing pre presented a proposed chapter of the department's rules related to code section 32-2-82, which was added to title 32 last se session and went into effect July 1st, 2021. New Chapter 672-22 contains nine rules that establish policies and general procedures governing alternative contracting methods. The rules will be posted on the website of GDOT's Office of Alternative Delivery and the Board will vote on adopting the rules at the January Board meeting. As far as committee actions, Jerry Sharon made a motion to approve the notice of intended action and to open the rules for public comment, seconded by Robert Brown and unanimously approved. There being no further business, I adjourn the meeting at 2.55. I now ask for a motion from the full board to approve the notice of intended action to open the rules for public comment. Do we have a motion? Do we have a second? All in favor? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, now we do have one item under new business, and uh, as, as we typically do, we're going to, be, are going to change our board meeting in December to a week earlier just to take the, the ease out of our holidays. So at this time, I'm going to ask for a motion to move the December board meeting from the third Tuesday in December to the second, th or third Thursday, I'm sorry, in December to the second Thursday. Do I have a motion? Do you have a second? All in favor? Okay, with that, we can't, uh, we'll, we'll be seeing everyone in our holiday season next month. So at this time, the meeting is adjourned. <laughs>